Prince of all, my lord, ladies and gentlemen, um, it is a real pleasure to be here. Whether the pleasure will be yours remains to be seen. Let me begin by quoting Tam Yell of blessed memory. He said that devolution and the creation of a Scottish Parliament was a motorway that would lead to the demand for Scottish independence with no exit points along the way. George Robertson, happily still with us, said that devolution would kill the SNP stone dead. And I think that Tam has so far proved to be the more reliable of the prophets. So there are those who though there are those like Gordon Brown who believe that urgent steps need to be taken to save the Union. By contrast, there are those, probably including the government in London, who believe that nothing needs to be done. Given time, the SNP will lose credibility. The dangers and disadvantages of life outside the Union will become ever more apparent and the devolution settlement is perfectly sound and stable as it is. Well, they may be right, but they may not. And so are we on a motorway that leads inexorably to independence, or are there exit points along the way? More concretely, one can put the question in this way, is there a workable basis on which a stable relationship can be established between, on the one hand, the Scottish Parliament and Government, and on the other, the Parliament and Government of the United Kingdom. And let me say at once that I'm neither a nationalist, nor, as I used to be, a totally committed unionist. I have become ambivalent, so I don't argue from either viewpoint. But I am afraid that we've got beyond a point at which purely political uh, solutions don't suffice. We can urge Westminster and Holyrood to treat each other with respect, but they don't. We can urge them to work together in joint ministerial committees, but that proposes a willingness to work together Otherwise, the committees simply become no more than a talking shop, words used by the former First Minister of Wales. The arguments to and fro are summarised by the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee of the House of Commons in their report entitled Devolution and Exit Exiting the EU reconciling differences and building strong relationships. Sadly, the report is strong on what people should do, in spite of all that we know what they are likely to do. As to what might be done, there are those who argue for a form of federalism, but I don't find that in itself particularly helpful for several reasons. First, as a strongly unionist professor of constitutional law put it way back in 1910, there's a great danger of our being enslaved by the poverty of our political vocabulary. The term federalism is put to such new and alien uses as to darken counsel and confuse thought. Second, there are many types of federalism. The United States, Canada, Switzerland, Germany, all are all federal and very unlike each other in their origin, conception, and working. For myself, I prefer the approach of Madison, the father, or at least the principal author, of the US Constitution, who wrote this towards the end of his life, and I quote it at length because I think it's sound, although 
the language is rather archaic. The more, the more the political system of the United States is fairly examined, the more necessary it will be found to abandon the abstract and technical modes of expounding and designating its character, and to view it as laid down in a charter, in the charter which constitutes it, as a system hitherto without a model as neither a simple nor a consolidated government or a confederate one, and therefore not to be explained so as to make it either, but to be explained and designated according to the actual division and distribution of political power on the face of the instrument. In other words, the relevant question is what powers are to be allocated where and how is their exercise to be controlled. Thirdly, working federalism implies some degree of uniformity of, com of the component units. Not of course complete uniformity of size, wealth or influence, but not such vast disparity as there is between England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. In particular, I think the position of Northern Ireland requires special consideration and special treatment. In other working federations, disparities in size, wealth, and influence tend to be ironed out, though not totally eliminated, by the number of their component units it would be unrealistic to treat the regions of England as if they were in a par, on a par with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, quite apart from the clear evidence that there is no appetite there for that kind of treatment. In short, as Professor Wynne Jones put it in his evidence for the House of Commons, the position of England within the United Kingdom Constitution is the elephant in the room that we constantly ignore. Fourth, there's no evidence of an appetite in England for the creation of a Parliament of England separate from the Parliament of Westminster. So long as that remains the Parliament of the UK, the members from Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, even if they were all to vote in the same way, would always be outvoted by the members from England or a working majority of them. The disparity has actually been aggravated by the reduction in the number of members from Wales and Scotland as a consequence of devolution, even though there are other justifications for that. And English votes for English laws, known as evil, does seem to um, fit its uh, acronym because it doesn't seem to work harmoniously either. A federal fifth point, a federal type Senate of the Regions, which has been proposed to replace the House of Lords, would still suffer from the same disparities because of the difference in size, even it might otherwise help to ensure the continuity of the Union. So, those are my reasons for thinking that federalism as such isn't sufficient, but I don't say that we can't learn from the experience of federal systems and institutions elsewhere. It's reasonable to bear in mind the basic intention that lies behind federal institutions Ideally, a federal institution, uh, institution will seek to strike a balance between certainty through a clear definition of constitutional competences and, on the other hand, the flexibility which comes from avoiding excessive precision. And from that point of view, the allocation of powers in the Scotland Act of 1998 seems in many ways to strike a reasonable balance between certainty and flexibility. Nevertheless, 
as the call to save the Union shows, something more flexible, something more fundamental is lacking. And the problem, so it seems to me, lies in the unqualified claim to supremacy of the Westminster Parliament that lies at the heart of the Scotland Act in section 28. After empowering the Scottish Parliament to legislate, the Act provides this section does not affect the power of the Parliament of the United Kingdom to make laws for Scotland. Before discussing what that might mean in practice and the effect of the so-called Sewell Convention, I'd like to look at the history of Westminster's claim to supremacy. It's had some beneficial consequences and some unhappy ones, of which the first was the loss of the American colonies. You remember that amongst the complaints of the American colonists set out in the Declaration of Independence in 1776 was that the king has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatever. Nor have we been wanting in attention to our British brethren we have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. Despite the setback, the British Empire continued to grow, establishing many colonies with their own legislatures, but subject always to the asserted supremacy of what became known as the Imperial Parliament. The Imperial Parliament continued as an expression to be used well into the last century, although no attempt was ever made to change its composition to reflect its Imperial pretensions. It was, and still is, the Parliament of the United Kingdom, in which England plays the predominant role. During the early part of the 19th century, questions arose as to the validity of laws passed by colonial parliaments, because they were, or were said to be, uh, inconsistent with the laws of the imperial parliament, a state of affairs that lawyers know as, know as repugnancy. This proved to be a particular problem in South Australia where legislative havoc was created by an obstinate Yorkshireman, and they're all obstinate perhaps, <laughs> Benjamin Boothby. He'd been sent out by the colonial office to be a justice of the Supreme Court of South Australia. And once there, he struck down a number of local statutes on grounds of repugnancy. He held that a newly elected Parliament of South Australia had not been validly constituted and he challenged the appointment of two new justices on the grounds that only barristers trained in England or Ireland were eligible, eligible for appointment. Partly in consequence of this, in 1865, Westminster passed another act called the Colonial Laws Validity Act. And this prescribed with some precision the circumstances in which a colonial law might be declared void for repugnancy. And to overcome the depredations of Benjamin Boothby, the Act also provided for the absolute right of colonial legislatures to establish courts of law 
to provide for the administration of justice and to determine the constitution, powers and procedure of the legislature. The Act provides a technique of statutory interpretation which is analogous to the technique known in English law as reading down, interpreting statutes to bear a meaning that is constitutionally valid, that was described by an Australian scholar as good law for the bad man. This in turn is analogous to the technique in European Union law known as the Mar Leasing method of interpretation where EU legislation appears to conflict with national legislation. And along the same lines in very recent years, in the case concerning the conflict between the UK Parliament's Withdrawal Act and the Scottish Parliament's Legal Continuity Bill, the UK Supreme Court conducted a close comparison between the terms of the UK statute and the Holyrood statute to see how far they were in fact compatible. Now statutory interpretation may seem to be a pretty dry subject for those who have the misfortune to be lawyers and even more dry for you if you're not lawyers but it does have political consequences as the experience of Canada shows. In 1867, Westminster enacted the British North America Act, which laid down the governmental structure of the new dominion to be known as Canada, with its own parliament of two houses, a Senate and a House of Commons. The Act allocated power between the Federal Parliament and the legislatures of the provinces, each of which was given exclusive powers over a wide range of topics. The powers of the Parliament of Canada were, and still are, to make laws for the peace, order and good government of Canada in relation to all matters not coming within the classes of subjects assigned exclusively to the legislatures of the provinces. The list of matters falling within the exclusive legislative authority of the Parliament of Canada is then added for greater certainty. But the crucial point is that the powers of the federal parliament were subject to the uh, classes of subjects assigned exclusively to the legislatures of the provinces. The yin and yang of that kind of, uh, of these two sets of exclusive powers was policed by the Ju Judicial Committee of the Privy Council which had become over the years the ultimate court of appeal for the empire, presided in many cases by a Scottish judge, Lord Watson. The judgments known as the advice of the Judicial Committee tended to favor the Canadian provinces on the basis that the act was clear the powers of the federal parliament could not intrude on the exclusive powers of the provinces. It's been argued <coughs> by some lawyers that this is because the Judicial Committee approached interpretation of the Act as if it were just an ordinary statute allocating <coughs> powers between subordinate authorities rather than an embryo constitution calling for different canons of interpretation. <coughs> and the approach of the Privy Council made it necessary for Westminster pa to pass a series <coughs> of British North America Acts in order to allow the Parliament of Canada to legislate on a variety <coughs> of matters 
such as the accession of new provinces, the jurisdiction of the provinces over natural resources, the jurisdiction of the federal parliament over unemployment insurance, and the power to pass legislation on old age pensions. The British North America Act, in fact, never reached the stage of becoming a constitution in an independent and highly influential state as Canada has become, until it was repatriated by the Canada Act of, 18, of 1982 in the UK Parliament, and that was retitled, the old act was retitled in Canada, the Constitution Act. The Canadian experience, I think, illustrates three points which are relevant for our purposes. Firstly, problems arise where exclusive powers are allocated to different levels of government. Second, conflict between exclusive powers can be policed by a court. And the third point, the approach of the court may help or hinder the solution of problems that lie hidden behind the legalism of statutes. One of the strong arguments against the Privy Council's approach has been that while the allocation of exclusive powers to the provinces may have been appropriate to the mid-19th century economy of Canada, it proved to be a legislative straitjacket as the modern economy developed. Thus, for example, the exclusive powers of the provinces enabled them to maintain or erect non-tariff barriers to intra-Canada trade. In other words, they stood in the way of the creation of a single economic market in the Dominion. And we can contrast in that respect the way in which the EEC treaty, which outlawed covered um, restrictions on trade, opened up the single market in areas as unexpected as the free movement of tile layers, lawyers, and picture conservators. Now, I'm not in a position to assess the economic consequences for Canada. But the experience may act as a warning in relation to the current uh, reallocation of powers that will, as the saying goes, be repatriated from Brussels. And you watch this space for long and dreary battles to come. There is, however, a, against that point of view, a point of view expressed by Pierre Trudeau, father, who remarked that without the Privy Council's support for provincial economy, Quebec separation might not be a threat today, but an accomplished fact. The 1867 Act provided for the uh, special circumstances of Quebec as a former province of France, speaking French and living under a common law, a civil law legal system. And the protection of minorities became a constant refrain in the case law of the Privy Council. For example, in relation to the rights of Native Americans, or perhaps more accurately, on the power of the provinces to regulate their privilege of hunting or fishing or to dispossess them of tribal lands. Indeed, in another context, a 19th century traveler to India reported having come across a village in which the people were offering a sacrifice to the judicial committee of the Privy Council <laughs> because they had returned their lands to them. In 1929, the approach of the Privy Council to constitutional interpretation 
underwent a sea change in the startling case of Edwards against Canada, known as the Persons case. The 1867 Act had provided for a two-chamber parliament, an elected commons, and a senate to consist of qualified persons appointed by the Governor General. And the question that arose was whether women could be qualified persons eligible for appointment to the Senate. And the Supreme Court of Canada held by a majority that they were not. The case was appealed to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council and writing for the committee, the Lord Chancellor, Labour Lord Chancellor, Lord Sankey, said that the exclusion of women from all public offices is a relic of days more barbarous than ours. To those who ask why the word person should include females, the obvious answer is why should it not? On arriving at that, in arriving at that conclusion, Lord Sankey set out an entirely new approach to the interpretation of constitutional statutes. He said, the British North America Act planted in Canada a living tree capable of growth and expansion within its natural limits. The object of the Act was to grant a constitution to Canada. Like all written constitutions, it's been subject to development through usage and convention. Their lordships do not conceive it to be their duty, and it is certainly not their desire, to cut down the provisions of the Act by a narrow and technical construction but rather to give it a large and liberal interpretation so that the dominion to a great extent, with, but within certain fixed limits, may be mistress in its own house, in the provinces and the provinces to a great extent, but again within certain fixed limits, to be mistress in theirs. I may say that decisions of the Privy Council in favour of minorities didn't find universal favour. In one case, after an appeal from, the Privy, from New Zealand, the answer led to public protests in the streets by lawyers and also by judges and by a judicial statement that New Zealand courts should not follow the decisions of the Judicial Committee. In the end, however, New Zealand was the last of the old dominions to abolish the right of appeal to the Privy Council. Because, whatever its practical merits, the right of appeal to a court sitting in London was seen as a badge of inferiority. Going back to 1929 and the Persons case, very soon after, it was followed by the Westminster, the Statute of Westminster. The issue of Westminster supremacy had been discussed at imperial conferences in 1926 and 1930. And the outcome was the British Act known as the Statute of Westminster, which declared that no act of the Un Parliament of the United Kingdom passed after the commencement of this Act shall extend or be deemed to extend to a dominion as part of the law of that dominion unless it is expressly declared in that Act that that dominion has requested and consented to the enactment thereof. The dominions in question were the old dominions, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and in those days, the Irish Free State, and Newfoundland. And the way in which the uh, British North America Act was converted into the Canadian Constitution Act was because Canada requested, and indeed had to request, 
the United Kingdom Parliament to enact the, uh, the act which brought the supremacy of Westminster to an end. With the mention of the Irish Free State, we can turn nearer home to the vexed saga of Irish Home Rule, which offers some lessons for our situation. I don't go any further back, because it's a long, long story, I don't go any further back than the Government of Ireland Act of 1914. The coming into force of that Act was suspended with the outbreak of the First World War, and indeed it never came into force. The Act began by providing for the creation of an Irish Parliament. A Senate and a House of Commons, but it went on to declare that notwithstanding the establishment of the Irish Parliament, the supreme power and authority of the Parliament of the United Kingdom shall remain unaffected and undiminished over all persons, matters and things in Ireland and every part thereof. And subject to that, the Act went on to empower the Irish Parliament to make laws for the peace, order and good government of Ireland, but subject again to a long list of exceptions. Section 3 of the Act prohibited laws interfering with religious equality, a provision that was deemed necessary to afford statutory protection to the Protestant minority in what would become an Ireland of 32 counties with a Catholic majority. Section 28 transferred the ultimate Court of Appeal from the House of Lords to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. After the war, the Act of 1914 was not, as I say, brought into force and a new Government of Ireland Act was passed in 1920, providing for two Home Rule Irelands, the 26 counties of the South and the six counties of the North. And the Parliament of Northern Ireland, constituted under the Act, came into being in 1929. Again, although the scheme of the Act differed considerably from the 1914 Act, it still provided that the supreme authority of the Parliament of the United Kingdom shall remain unaffected and undiminished over all persons, matters and things in Ireland and every part thereof. And that proved to be a major bone of contention in the negotiations that led after much bloodshed to the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921. And that treaty provided for the creation of a new dominion to be known as the Irish Free State and sharing the same position as the other dominions. And it provided for the Parliament of Northern Ireland to vote to join the Free State, which it did not do. As we've seen, Westminster's claim to supremacy in relation to the Dominions was formally ended by the Statute of Westminster. Although the representatives of the Free State maintained that it had already been ended by the Anglo-Irish Treaty. The appellate jurisdiction of the Judicial Committee in relation to Ireland had an unhappy history and on one occasion an inglorious one. In a case concerning the remuneration of civil servants who had been transferred to the service of the Free State, the Privy Council held that they were entitled to higher compensation than that to which the Irish Supreme Court had held they were entitled. And it turned out that that was due to an error as to dates for which the former Lord Chancellor, Lord Cave, who had chaired the committee, had been responsible. 
the ever. It didn't help that Cave himself was an ardent unionist. Eventually, when Cave was already on his deathbed, the other members of the committee, led by another former Lord Chancellor, Lord Holding, had to stand up before the House of Lords and admit that they were wrong and seek amendment. Lord Dunedin, declared, the Scottish judge, declared that it was no pleasant matter to stand in a white sheet and say you were wrong, but that it would be cowardly for a man to run away and not accept his share of responsibility. Lord Finlay, another Scottish judge, avoided this humiliating exhibition by pleading ill health. <laughs> Eventually, the Free State abolished the jurisdiction in 1933. <coughs> the history of the relationship between the UK authorities and the Parliament of Northern Ireland was rather different. Notwithstanding the Westminster claim of supremacy, one of the foremost constitutional experts, Sir Ivor Jennings, argued in 1959 that it would be unconstitutional for the United Kingdom Parliament to exercise the legal power of legislation in matters delegated to the Parliament of Northern Ireland, except with the consent of that Parliament. In the light of more recent events, the reason for this policy of non-intervention is not entirely clear, given that it is not uh, thought to preclude intervention uh, in matters delegated to the Parliament of Scotland. But the reason may lie in one of the discussion papers submitted in 1973 when uh, the UK government had to decide what to do after it had abolished the Parliament of Northern Ireland. One of the submissions said, there's a view that any new legislature should not be called a parliament. The title of parliament and the adoption of elaborate Westminster procedures have not only been out of proportion to the real functions independently performed, and to the size of the population covered by them in Northern Ireland. But it has also promoted a false view of Stormont sovereignty, which has been positively harmful. One malign consequence of non-intervention was that it allowed the Parliament of Northern Ireland to do precisely what the Government of Ireland Act had tried to prevent discrimination against minorities. The aim had been to protect the Protestant minority against a predominantly Catholic parliament of all Ireland. But because of the policy of non-intervention, the precautions that were then put in place didn't prevent discrimination against the Catholic minority population in Northern Ireland. And the consequence, as we know to our cost, was the troubles. And now I apologize for that long and perhaps over long tour around the history of Westminster supremacy, but now let's come to see how the lessons learned from past experience can be applied to our present situation. <coughs> First of all, let's note that the fact that the Scottish Parliament is a Parliament and not an Assembly, as was proposed in the failed Scotland Act of 1978, has a particular resonance. Perhaps that's because of the insistence on the sovereignty of the Westminster Parliament. But there are many Parliaments around the world that don't insist on their absolute sovereignty or supremacy. Indeed, a close study of the work of A.B. Dicey, who uh, fully fleshed out the theory of parliamentary sovereignty, a close study of his work shows that he was concerned 
uniquely with the legislative sovereignty of Parliament, of Westminster, which he understood to be the monarch, the House of Lords, and the House of Commons acting together, which is why in the introduction to his last edition before his death, he repudiated the notion of absolute sovereignty because the Parliament Act had eliminated the control of the House of Lords. Moreover, in the, even in his initial analysis, he recognized that there were practical limits to legislative sovereignty. As he said, a sovereign may wish to do many things which he either cannot do at all or can do only at great risk to serious, of serious resistance. For example, it would be rash of the imperial parliament to abolish the Scotch law courts and assimilate the law of Scotland to the law of England. No one can feel sure at what point Scotch resistance to such a change will become serious. James Bryce uh, referred to sovereignty as a dusty, dusty desert of abstractions through which successive generations of political philosophers have felt it necessary to lead their disciples. It seems to me to be yet another of these words that darken counsel and confuse thought. We're better off without it, so it seems to me, if we're to determine how the powers of Westminster and Holyrood should be allocated and controlled. As we've seen in the case of Canada, it would be possible to approach the problem by the allocation of exclusive powers. This has, in one respect, been done in the Scotland Act by allocating reserved powers to Westminster but it only works one way and the powers of Hollywood are clearly and explicitly not exclusive. <coughs> a system of exclusive and shared powers was envisaged in the embryo <coughs> constitution drawn up by the Scottish National Assembly in 1948 which was led by John McCormick, father of Professor Sir Neil McCormick of blessed memory. You'll find this constitution, embryo constitution, printed as an appendix to John McCormick's autobiography, The Flag in the Wind, which has been republished with a fine introduction by Neil. Incidentally, we may remark that the Scottish National Assembly or the Scottish Covenant that followed was not the work of the SNP. John McCormick, known as King John, had been forced out of the party in 1942 by a faction led by Douglas Young, a graduate of this university and later a lecturer here. McCormick stood as a national candidate in opposition to Labour in the Paisley by-election of 1947 and there he was supported by such Tory worthies as Walter Elliot, Peter Thornycroft, Reginald Manning and Buller, and Lady Tweedsmuir. So uh, don't confuse John McCormick with the SNP, although he later acquired eternal fame as the pursuer in the case of McCormick against the Lord Advocate, against the title Elizabeth II and E2R on pillar boxes. The most powerful argument against a system of mutually exclusive powers is, as I've suggested, the economic argument that the rigidity of exclusive powers militates against the flexibility that a modern economy requires. The scheme of the Scotland Act 1998, unlike the failed Act of 1978, is flexible to the extent that having reserved specific powers to Westminster 
all the other powers are left to Holyrood. But the problem lies in the assertion of unqualified Westminster supremacy in section 28.7 of the Act. The current solution to that problem is the so-called Sewell Convention, based on assurance given by Lord Sewell, then a government minister, during the passage of the Scotland Bill through the House of Lords. And he, this convention says, this assurance said, that the Parliament of the United Kingdom will not normally, le normally legislate with regard to devolved matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. This led to the system of legislative consent motions by which the Scottish Parliament consents to legislation by Westminster. And for a long time that worked well and some 160 legislative consent motions were passed. Notwithstanding the relative success of the system, there was pressure for the Sewell Convention to be placed on a firmer footing than a ministerial assurance and the Smith Commission recommended that the Convention should be placed on a statutory footing. This was done in the Scotland Act of 2016, so that the Act now reads, this section doesn't affect the power of the Parliament of the United Kingdom to make laws for Scotland, but it is recognised that the Parliament of the United Kingdom will not normally legislate with regard to devolved matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. The interpretation of that provision, and we're back again to statutory interpretation, I'm afraid. The interpretation of that came before the Supreme Court in the first Miller case about the power of the executive to give an Article 50 notice without parliamentary consent. In a few brief paragraphs, the Supreme Court held that despite statutory enactment, the convention remains no more than a convention. And the court said, the policing of its scope and the manner of its operation does not lie within the constitutional remit of the judiciary, which is to protect the rule of law. Personally, I confess that that seems to me to have been a lost opportunity. It's true that the statute had, been, had simply enacted the terms of the Convention. But as I see it, the intention was to place the Convention on a statutory footing and to remove it from the sphere of non-justiciable conventions. However, that is for another day and what can be done now. It's been made abundantly clear in the contorted process of enacting the EU Withdrawal Act that the present government doesn't regard the statutory enactment of the Sewell Convention as being in any way binding on it or on the Westminster Parliament. The Scottish Parliament has simply been told to get on with its day job. For myself, if the Union is to be saved, it is essential to introduce some form of independent institutional policing of the relationship between Westminster and Holyrood. Past experience suggests that the boundaries of that relationship might be the work of a court. In the Scotland Act, as originally enacted, this was to be the Judicial Committee, a jurisdiction now transferred to the Supreme Court. But the exercise of purely judicial oversight in the Brexit and prorogation cases has been questioned, first in a rather ambivalent way by Lord Sumption, and others who see a clear distinction between law and politics, the fields of law and the field of politics. For myself, that's an absurd binary distinction 
that bears no re relationship to the real world, although it may have some meaning to Lord Sumption. <laughs> More importantly, the present Westminster government seems to be determined rather to clip the wings of the judiciary rather than enlarge their jurisdiction. And it may be questioned whether the Supreme Court, the which is the ultimate court of appeal in a very wide range of legal issues, is best placed to act as the referee in issues between Westminster and Hollywood. And that leads me to wonder whether a more imaginative solution might be found in the jurisdiction of the Privy Council. I am a member of the Privy Council, but I've been told that that has only one advantage. I will be given an invitation to the coronation. <laughs> the Judicial Committee is, after all, simply a committee of a larger body, selectively or appointed to perform specifically judicial functions. But the Privy Council as such is a very large body from the membership of which it would be possible to compose a constitutional committee which might act as a constitutional policeman. And that could include, as well as judges and other lawyers, members of, with experience of government and public affairs, whether as politicians, civil servants, or in so many other ways. Of course, it would be necessary to adjust the terms of the Scotland Act to remove the suggestion that the policing of the boundary is purely political. That would have to be part of the package. At any rate, whatever may be the best solution, and mine is only very embryonic, the current standoff suggests that we are speeding down Tandy Hill's motorway. Political assurances of good behaviour and the establishment of more interministerial and interparliamentary committees won't lead us to a secure exit. After all, it's in the nature of politics that politicians disagree and seek to exercise power as against others. And the question, and I come back to that, is how that power should be divided and distributed, in Madison's words, and how, in the words of Parliament itself, the distribution and division and distribution of powers should be policed so as to ensure peace, order, and good government.